Okay, uh, let's take a deeper dive into this reference inverter design. Uh, there's a, a presentation we can follow, and we'll let um, Mark and Jonathan lead the way here. Go ahead. Okay, Jonathan, let's go talk about this reference design that we did. Um, it's called TIDM02014 on our TI.com website, also known as this 300 kilowatt traction inverter uh, reference design. So, Jonathan, one of the things um, that's really cool about this reference design is it's complete. So you can see here the entire setup. You can see basically your um, DC voltage that comes in directly here, and it hits all of the uh, semiconductor devices, including the silicon carbide modules, which are underneath here. And so um, working clockwise, what you'll see is the MCU or the microcontroller board. So we have uh, these you know, various microcontrollers, uh, whether you look at C2000 or a device called Citara, this is kind of a card that uh, slips in here. And we talked about the FOC control. This is that device that runs the FOC control that runs the entire inverter, taking the DC bus voltage and transferring that into a three-phase AC waveform. Um, here is the gate driver board. There are three of them um, and basically connected to three of the XM3 gate driver modules from Wolfspeed. Which are uh, and half bridge devices, the, uh, right? I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, just to kind of clarify, correct. that's why there's three. There, normally, there's six switches for a three-phase control, and each one of these modules provides the uh, the uh, north and south switch, if you will. So just clarify. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And so there's basically six gate drivers in here as well for high side, low side, high side, low side, high side, low side. So you have basically six gate drivers across the entire uh, three half bridges. Um, and so you'll... One of the cool, one of the really cool things we did when we were in we were in Arkansas was basically taking apart one of these modules and looking at what's inside. You can see um, the the composition of the exactly how these modules are made and how it looks like from in die form. Uh, so the other thing we have are basically um, you know current sensors that are located under underneath here. So with that, we basically have a a system that can drive a motor. Right, we've got the brain of the system. We've got the DC bus voltage. Um, we have basically the position sensing uh, input. And then we've got the uh, current sense to be able to have all the information necessary for my FOC control. So what we have here is the, um, uh, the exact part numbers. And I won't get into it. But as I mentioned, we have the microcontrollers, the voltage sensors, the silicon carbide modules, which are the XM3 modules, uh, the current sense lines, which are coming across from all three phases connected to here. Um, we have the resolver. Uh, front end. So we have motor position coming in directly here. And then we've got the CAN interface, which is really important for later because we'll show you how we connect to the uh, the e-motor emulator or the hardware and loop simulator. We talked a little bit about FOC control, and this is um, getting into very nitty gritty, gritty details. But essentially, FOC control is basically taking your angle and your speed together with your DC link voltage, as well as your phase currents to generate the PWM voltages necessary to the gate driver, which then drives this uh, motor. So you basically have a closed loop control, which is taking into consideration your various factors, including voltage, current, um, angle, and speed, right? And along the way, you have to look at you know temperature, um, your motor temperature limit, uh, and, and your silicon carbide temperature, because you want you know, you're, you're talking about human life. And, and so this is kind of a, a safety type of application. So, you know, we have to run the diagnostics, um, you know, in parallel with the driving of the motor. Now, I should point out that that lower right hand corner on that slide, you know, where the resolver measures the angular position speed of the motor rotor, that would be in a stationary power application like you'd use for, uh, you know, grid energy storage inverters, large solar inverters, whatever, um, that would be one area that would change in hardware so that you could monitor the 60 or 50 hertz that's used for the, the grid. So, uh, you know, it's a nice modular piece that uh, could be switched out relatively easy in this uh, reference design. So... Well, like we said, I think a lot of this application, it's, it's applicable to almost everything, right? So these resolvers, position sensors, right? We have a lot of applications in the real world where we actually have to monitor the position of the motor in relation to speed and, and so on. Um, so even like when you roll down your window or 
or any kind of basic motor type of application or, or different frequency, like a 50, 60 hertz application for industrial, yeah, you, you would have the same kind of setup. Um, and in that respect, this design could easily be used towards other types of energy storage or other types of industrial designs. Very good, thanks. Jonathan, do you want to maybe take this one and, or I, you know, why don't you take a shot at this one? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So this is our e-motor emulator test setup um, that we have uh, in our lab um, in Germany, um, in, in our Wolf Speed lab, uh, to clarify. Um, and so, you know, this is a great, um, you know, test uh, capability that we have in-house um, that we're uh, obviously taking advantage of. Um, you know, with this reference design and proving out the the system, um, both from the from the power semiconductor and from the TI solution set. So, um, we started in Arkansas with our inductive load test bench, um, but like Mark previously mentioned, that's kind of just a simple inductive load. Um, there's no real closed loop control going on, and um, you know, really just exercising power on the on the entire unit. Um, so the kind of a first debug step. And then this is that next level where we can actually put this um, in this test system, um, you know, take measurements on an oscilloscope, use the power analyzer to um, get the efficiency data uh, of the inverter um, under test. And of course the e-motor emulator to emulate that, that motor. So we can kind of get these performance curves, uh, which is very critical for the, the traction uh, inverter reference design. Yeah, the, the motor emulator makes it hardware in the loop, if you will, sort of, so to speak. Um, um, a subject near and dear to my heart. This would be, again, where you might um, change the thing you're emulating. Uh, it's still going to be a three-phase device, but various sizes of, you know, motor can be emulated. And wow, how much easier is it to do it in the virtual world than to actually have to switch in the real motor, especially a motor that may not exist yet. You know, you're, you may still be in the design right. phases of that as well. So that's right. So this, that's one of the, I mean, I, this is one of the reasons why TI and Wolfspeed partnered together because um, a lot of people do the inductive load testing, which again is a kind of an open loop test. It's kind of like, okay, my power stage can run like this and I'm not looking at rotational angle or position of the motor, but it's not until you actually close the loop of the system that you are actually able to measure the efficiency of the power stage, like this 80 and 80%, right? So the efficiency of the power stage together with the efficiency of the motor, what this allows you to do, and by the way, this is a multi-million dollar setup. Um, uh, basically, it allows you to put a motor model into the system and it emulates that motor. So I'm not having to drive a real motor and I'm, get, I'm able to extract the actual efficiency of my um, power stage controlling the actual motor. And you'll see some of those results later. So yeah, here we're looking at the inverter actually inside um, the E uh, motor emulator test uh, bench. Um, so you have you know, the connections of the power, the, the DC uh, plus and minus coming in, the three phase motor connections coming from the inverter um, and then into the e-motor emulator cabinet. Um, and of course we have all of the uh, auxiliary components around it, uh, cooling system, because that's actually a, a fairly critical component to testing the efficiency is, is how well you're actually cooling the power semiconductor devices. Um, the, and then the feedback um, not only is done on the uh, inverter control board itself, like Mark mentioned, the resolver enc encoder temperature um, but also we have that feedback into the the e motor emulator test uh, setup. So, um, Mark, is there anything that that you'd like to add? No, this looks like a rat's nest, but actually, it's yeah. it's not actually that <laughs> bad when you look at the uh, when you look at the waveforms because all you're really doing is trying to take a look at the take a look at the outputs. But you do need right. to provide all of the stimulus, right? So you're getting the the angle of the motor and and basically everything is emulated by the hardware and loop simulator here. Um, so yeah, one person's rat's nest is another person's <laughs> meticulously organized test bench. So um, yeah, I appreciate that. So um, Tom, you mentioned this, you know, this efficiency map, and here it is. Basically, the result of doing all of this testing on the e-motor emulator or the Hill hardware and loop simulator. This curve looks scary, um, but it's really not that hard to read. Basically, yellow, um, and it's hard to differentiate between these colors here. 
the, the yellow basically means you're at 100% efficiency. This is the highest efficiency that you'll get. And then, you know, the, the blue is where you're starting to drop off. Now, this particular motor was a model um, that was the model this motor was given to us by one of our customers, one of our key customers out there because they wanted to test this um, and they wanted our help on this design. And so you can see that this particular motor responds as follows, right? If you're having um, low RPMs and low torque, that's not what this model, this motor is designed for. What the motor is designed for is basically in this range here. If I, uh, if I look at this little half moon here, um, there's like a 99% efficiency curve here. So anytime I'm operating at this RPM and at this particular torque, let's say 9,000 RPM and 90 Newton meters of torque, um, I'm able to achieve 99% efficiency on my inverter. Um, and I, as I start decreasing my RPMs, I start decreasing my efficiency going from 98.95, 98.59, 97, 95. And that's kind of how you read this map. Now, the really cool thing is if I was able to uh, intelligently change my gate drive strength, then in theory, I should see the curve actually shift to the left, right? So what I mean by that, if I'm running at, for example, 5,000 uh, RPM, and let's say 40, let's say this is about 40 Newton meters of torque, if I'm able to change my gate drive strength, I should see this 97.7 uh, efficiency actually go up. So I should see these curves, if you will, these, these little exponential curves shift to the left. And if I look at it, if I compare slides from slide 15 to slide 16, you actually see that, right? So I, if I just kind of go back and forth, you're actually seeing the curve shift. So that means that in that same 5,000 RPM, 40 Newton meter of torque, I'm actually above 97.78. Now it's closer to some, it's closer to 98. Um, and so you're seeing that in general, everything shifted because <laughs> that's the effect of the gate driver working together with the silicon carbide. And in general, um, what happens is when you're able to gain this efficiency, you have um, overall better uh, performance. And that's that where that 2% comes in. Yeah, interesting. Of course, you have to assess the trade-offs too. If I choose to use the strong drive, I hope I didn't create some sort of an EMI problem or uh, some other issue. Um, so yeah, now I have I have a way to, uh, through an experiment environment, uh, iterate and optimize. So you know when right. to apply the strong drive and when not to. Right, and I will mention that you know Wolfspeed and TI, we we specifically worked together on this because we wanted to give this setup. Um, we wanted to have our customers be able to access this setup again. As I mentioned in the in the very beginning, um, you know we as a semiconductor supplier can just provide the chips and Wolfspeed could easily just provide those XM3 modules. But until you put these things together and, and put it into a real environment, um, you're putting it upon the onus of, you're putting the onus upon the, the, you know, car manufacturers to go do this and prove it. But here we're saying that here, come, here's our platform, come to our test setup and we've got everything ready for you to go using your model. If we look at this slide, um, this is essentially the uh, cumulative energy that was um, uh, basically consumed in the entire drive cycle. So the red line essentially is basically the energy that was consumed by using weak drive. And then the gray line is using what we call strong drive. And so you'll see these, you know, the ener energy consumption goes up and then maybe I have some regenerative, regenerative braking, so it goes back down. So as time goes up, my total cumulative energy consumed is this much, right? So at the end, I have some regenerative braking and I go down. And if I zoom in here, I get that 2% in savings. And that 2% in savings basically translates to either, you know, better consumption, which gives me better distance, or it gives me, um, you know, better overall uh, usage of the battery. And in general, what you can see here is that um, there is can be a $140 of battery savings or you could translate that to 15.5 more kilometers with the existing battery pack. Or you could say, uh, I could reduce the number of battery cells and, and save nine kilograms of weight. Or I can simply re, uh, inc get more space in the vehicle by reducing the size of the battery. So that 2% doesn't seem like a lot, but having that extra range or that extra you know, space um, over you know, the entire course of the year, just saving 15 kilometers is quite a bit uh, of, of gain. 
It so, sure adds up, doesn't it? Yeah. So interesting. Um, yeah, quite the reference design with uh, a methodology for uh, developing kind of built into it. Um, you know, you mentioned the multi-million dollar test bed. It's probably worth mentioning that um, not everybody's going to have that budget, and I don't want to scare people off with that. There are other, you know, methodologies that can be done to lower that cost, if you will. Um, but um, it, this is the way to do it. I, I really appreciate that you guys have brought it out and shown everyone how it works. 